bother you or distract you too much. Um, the idea, of course, is we got children's today, and uh, we're going to cut our Bible study short. If we ever get it started, it may not ever get started, but that'd be fine too. It's all right, because uh, the rest of you can figure it out, and we'll be fine. Um, I asked uh, Tom if he wanted to give us a little version of of uh, her, his dad, so I'll put him up here for a moment. Uh, briefly, uh, thank you all for your prayers for my dad, Robert. Uh, he is in the hospital with uh, COVID. Admitted him for pneumonia, then checked the. Huh? I'll get it for you. All right. You You're good. Yep. So, thank you all for uh, praying for my dad, Robert. He is in the hospital and uh, he is admitted with uh, COVID. So, he needs to be there uh, 10 days. And um, his uh, lung function is pretty good. Right now, he doesn't have a fever or anything. And uh, he seems to be cooperating uh, more. And he's hearing challenge. He's legally deaf, really. And so he tends to shake his head yes, even though he doesn't know what the question was. So given that, it's been a challenge. But we've been in contact with the nurse's station trying to tell him this is how you got to communicate, write it down. And uh, so again, thank you for your continued prayers. Thank you, Tom. And, uh we know that Ron has been taken off the uh, dialysis. dialysis, thank you for the word. And uh, so he has to uh, see if the kidneys are going to work. They have to put him on a different form of dialysis, which is the regular one that they would use for kidney failure in patients like that. Uh, the machine continues to breathe most of the oxygen into his lungs, which is obviously very serious. So continue to hold Ron up in prayer, and uh, obviously Lisa, the family, the kids, the grandkids, as they all kind of work through this uh, conflict of uh, Christmas and uh, uh, a loved one being in a serious condition, so be aware of that. We have a movie matinee today at 3.30 called The Christmas Child, and uh, it's a nice uh, Christmas movie. So if you're able to come back for that, it's 3.30, we did a matinee, and then you can all go to uh, uh, the uh, custard stand or the uh, wherever you want to go, but take the kids out to spend their uh, gift card if you haven't done so. I got corrected last Sunday as some of the adults were a little upset that yeah. they, didn't <coughs> they didn't get a gift card. So I told the kids, when their gift cards are all used up, please bring them to me and I'll get <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. Coffee at Culver's. No. <laughs> I yes. What'd you say? <laughs> Our Christmas Eve service is at five thirty. Make sure you make a note of that. Uh, if you were able to check your email and see your email, Lauren asks all of you to let us know if you're coming, planning on coming, God willing, obviously, and if you're bringing one to 102 friends, relatives, and everything else with us, or to us. We want to be uh, wise and careful and balanced in all we do, and so we, one of the things we have discussed is if a lot of people are coming, which we hope, praise God, people come. Uh, we talked about possibly running a second service, uh, maybe at 3.30, uh, you know, earlier one for people who are off and are able to come earlier. It'd be a little bit smaller group or a different size group, and then uh, larger groups and families can all show up without any particular problem, can sit six feet apart and uh, wear masks, not wear masks, whatever they're going to do. So that's just fine with us, but uh, that's what that information is for. And it will be discussed uh, uh, after the service uh, back there with the, the different people that uh, give me advice, counsel, and everything else. So uh, anyway, uh, those are the only announcements that I have that, unless you can think of something else, I, uh, I think Jim continues to improve from everything that I've read from his reports, and that's good news. Uh, continuing to pray that his lungs, lungs would finish clearing uh, and that kind of thing. 
And then uh, everybody else that I know of uh, that's dealt with COVID in one way or another seems to have fully recovered and running down the road again. So anyway, anything from you before we start? Let's pray. Here we go. Lord, uh, this is your place. We are your people. This is your body. Uh, unless uh, you build it, Lord, uh, there is no reason for us to gather. Unless you are lifted up, there is no reason for us to gather. Unless we, in submission and quiet reverence and brokenness, uh, submit ourselves to what your word has revealed, we are wasting your time and especially our time. And so, Lord, we ask that you would honor us today, that you would help us go through this. I pray a special grace over the kids as we hear them practicing in the background, Lord, that they would uh, just have a, a grace to cover them. They would be encouraged today. And uh, we would all be encouraged uh, with their enthusiasm, their joy, their rambunctiousness, Lord. Uh, and uh, remembering the days when we were able to do and have that kind of uh, intensity and joy. So come bless us, Lord, and uh, be in the conversation that we have today. Use it for your glory. We pray this all in your name. Amen. All right. <clears throat> we have got a little bit of time for the movie. So uh, John or Carol, oh, there you are, Carol, back there. We're going to try and run it again, if you could. And like I said, we're going to quit early so the kids can come up and practice. I just got to punch the... Uh, Play the, the video button. Peter says something entirely different. People who are healed by Jesus himself, who actually had the miracle of healing come from Jesus, still did not repent and believe. With the miracle of the ten lepers, which is in Luke 17, only one of them returned to praise Jesus and to praise God. I've seen examples of people who claim to be Christians going out in public and encountering people who don't know Jesus. And rather than sharing the gospel with them, they avoid that entirely and they shoot straight to signs and wonders. And apparently there is an epidemic in this country of people with having one leg just a little bit shorter than the other. In every sense, I would say Todd White is as much a magician as he claims to be a man of God. I would go around and look for people that were like limping with obvious sicknesses. Is there any problems at all physically? Uh, my back isn't the best. And I'd go up to them and ask to pray for them. They tell your leg's shorter, your one leg's shorter than the other one, yeah. and it throws you back out. So this is the Holy Ghost film from 2014. This is a really great trick, and you're gonna see in a moment here that it is a trick. So what I'll do, regardless of what you believe, I'm gonna pray for you, and Jesus is gonna grow your leg out and heal your back. Charlatans and snake oil salesmen have been doing this trick for decades. It's sleight of hand. So Father, I thank you in Jesus' name. Left leg, I command you grow right now. Jesus' name. Look at it. You see it? Oh. Look at that. Do you guys see that right there? Yes. It's longer now than the other one. And then if I was done, if they received it well, which most did, I'd be like, oh, God loves you so much. Have a good day. I'm not like out here to say you need to no dude. God loves you, bro. And that's it, man. December 5, man. Now we're gonna see Todd White's clip sped up quite a bit and looped back and forth. Now this is where we can see what's really going on here. The leg on our right is supposed to be the short leg, and this is the leg which should be miraculously growing, but it's not. Look at the leg on our left. That's where all the action is. That's what's actually being manipulated. You can see that Todd is actually pivoting or shifting the foot of the so-called long leg so that the heels match. Now, he's doing this very slowly over time, but it's painfully obvious when you speed up the clip. And what he is doing is the most hateful thing you could possibly do for someone. Men like Todd White preach a gospel that is centered on love. The problem is it's not biblical love. Biblical love confronts sin. If we really understand God's love, then we understand that God's love is a holy love. That because God is so loving, He must simultaneously reject and hate evil. 
Well, when I saw anyone preaching the real gospel, which is salvation through the cross, I thought that was kind of unloving because they talk about sin. Every one of us has broken his laws. My experience has been even those that call themselves Christians, they will oppose you, they reject a gospel presentation that includes calling people to repent. Repent and believe in the gospel. I'm not like out here to say you need to. I'm not out here to say you need to. I think he's choosing not to use the word repent, which is what Christians historically have always talked about. That is the reason why many people will refuse to become a Christian. They don't want to repent. They don't want to give up their sin. They like sinning. This method of evangelism by blessing it's changing the gospel from you are dead in your sins and this is what you need by God's grace, repentance and faith. It's changing that message to God loves you, he accepts you, here's some free stuff. He will cure you of your ailments, he'll fix your back pain. He prayed for me, my back got healed, prayed for my girlfriend, her, her head got healed, my ankle got healed. He helped to get clothes for my family, and now God told him to get a guitar. God's buying me this guitar, man. He goes, you're doing the gospel, man. Can I shake your hand? Because this is what Jesus would do. We don't live the gospel. We don't do the gospel. We receive it by faith. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. We have to speak to them the gospel. We have to preach the gospel. It's not enough that you just live a godly life before others. If that's all it is, they'll go to hell thinking you're a good person. I thought that if you go and heal someone or give someone money and we're just tell them, oh, Jesus loves you so much, man. Jesus loves you so much. That the goodness of God would lead them to repentance. God's goodness does lead us to repentance, but sometimes God's goodness doesn't look like what we think it looks like. Sometimes God's goodness is telling us how bad we really are. I love you enough to tell you the truth. So when you come along and say, you're great, you're special, you're amazing. God loves you and you're amazing. God is, you know, crazy about you. God's so impressed and so amazed by you. You're amazing. This is the opposite of what people need to hear. When they're at war with God, they don't need to be told how great they are. They need to be told that they are at war with God. To withhold the bad news is to share half the gospel. To share half the gospel is to not share the full gospel. We deserve hell for eternity because of our law breaking. And it's only through Christ's death on the cross, burial and resurrection, that he paid that penalty for our sins. The problem is not that the preacher has the wrong method. Jesus said, you can raise someone from the dead and still people will not believe. And that is why we faithfully preach the gospel because we know that as much as some will violently reject it, it is the means that God uses to bring his people to repentance and faith. We never want to withhold any portion of the gospel from people thinking that somehow we can trick them or fool them into the kingdom of God. Some of the questions I had growing up when I was in healing crusades with my uncle or my father was if we have these gifts of healing and we can do this for people, why don't we go to hospitals? It was very overwhelming having to feel that I had to pray for every single person that was sick. And I overthink things. So I would think things like, everyone with glasses needs healing. And then I'd look around and like, more than half the population's wearing glasses. So I'd be like, God, you really expect me to heal all these people? Like. Why can't we go to my school? Why can't we go to my friend's house and heal my friend of cancer in high school? Uh, why can't we do what we say we do? Why do we need music? I want to hear the instruments. I want to hear the strings. And one time I saw Bill Johnson ask someone, who, who got healing in their eyes? How many of you the sight something was healed with your eye? Put your hand up right now. OK, you can command dead people to rise up and people to get out of wheelchairs. And why are you still wearing glasses? That doesn't make sense. I've been to 17 different Benny Hinn Crusades as part of my research. And on one of these, I was being interviewed uh, for a documentary that was being done on Benny Hinn. And you see me trying to get up on the platform. Well, there was a lady who was on the Benny Hinn staff. She was talking with me. I'm standing there on my crutches. And you see this man come up and whisper in her ear. And the man you see is Henry Hinn, Benny Hinn's brother. Henry is Costi's father. Henry Hinn whispers in her ear, and then this lady tells me immediately, she says, sir, just step aside and pray for your healing. 
what was going on there is that they are screening people and they are keeping the truly sick, the obviously sick, the obviously handicapped people away from the platform. It's hard to sleep at night when there's dying babies whose moms brought them to the crusade services because your uncle could heal them and they gave their best offering, but they went home sick. In the back on the floor are dozens and dozens and dozens of sick people. I've seen parents with dying children, literally dying children in their arms, some of them hooked up to breathing machines. The only people who are allowed up on Benny Hinn's platform are people who have a malady that cannot be readily seen. It's always diseases or conditions that can be overcome with temporary rush of adrenaline or emotion, psychosomatic healings. You never see anyone who looks like me allowed up on the platform because I can't hide my condition and no matter how excited I may get, if you take my crutches away from me, uh, I'm going down. It's hard to sleep at night when you see wheelchair bound women holding their children and your family promises them health and hope and you can't give it to them. But you take their offering and you go live large off it. That's hard. It's not difficult to stand up for truth. It's hard to live a lie. And we are not ashamed of prosperity, nor will we apologize for prosperity because it is the promise of our Heavenly Father who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. One of the most painful parts of standing up for can truth stop it, Carol? <clears throat> is the losses that can come relationally. Thank you. Uh, any thoughts or reactions? Uh, the, the hard part when you watch this is the exposure of the inconsistencies of a Benny Hinn or the equivalent. Uh, and the challenge is that God still does heal and that you can expect miracles. And that's that balance between those two things. What's difficult, and I think he pointed it out, if you've got people who are concerned about, uh, uh, you know, <clears throat> you have people who are concerned about why, why can't we do this at the hospital? And those become legitimate things. Uh, if you've ever been in both prayer and healing, God did not, I mean, Jesus healed everybody he came in contact with. But Paul had the sometimes very selective healing, as Peter did. Uh, sometimes he healed a whole bunch of people in one area, one town. Uh, so there is a balance in this, but this has been exposed uh, for what it is in terms of uh, the uh, recognition of the inconsistencies and everything else that are going on there. Some of your thoughts or reactions to what's going on. Obviously, when they're willing to take money, that becomes even more controversial and everything else. Go ahead, John. I think in the beginning of this section, it was talking about where um, we've replaced the gospel um, of, you know, I don't know, this, this vague thing of love, with a full acceptance, 100% acceptance without uh, the truth coming behind it, God's love, you know, with the, the truth attached to it. I, mean, I, I see a lot more, um, <coughs> I see it growing where Christians, Christians that we grew up with, are come back and they condemn you because you have standards, and we all know that we're short of these standards, we fall short of those standards, that you're such a hateful person because you don't accept this person, that person, and because of their the sin that they're living in, and you uh, I think culturally, that's, that's, that's grown significantly. So the pressure is coming harder on, you know, because we don't, not that we don't accept human beings that are, you know, self-identified as homosexual or whatever, it's just that we identify with, yeah, that's a, that's a sin that's blatant, it's out there. We all have sexual sin that we have to deal with and all that, you're included, but if, if you're just denying that, you know, so, um, Yeah. In, in no, no doubt about it. No doubt yeah. about it. Last question, I guess. Yes. Any other thoughts <laughs> from you? Uh,
get caught up in that phase, but uh, um, I'm more interested in living a lifestyle and taking it well rather than living a voluntary existence. Very much so. Good observation. Yeah. It's, I mean, as soon as you start to experience it, it's not that you don't want to be, you don't want to create a situation where they feel justified hating you. Uh, uh, or where you feel like you're rising up in some kind of judgment because they'll frequently confront you. Do you think this is sin? And they'll name a particular peculiar sin that is bothersome to them. And I, I always try to have a line like, yeah, probably just as bad as any of my sins, or name a sexual sin or an emotional sin or an attitudinal sin or a marriage sin that I've participated in. So you sometimes can diffuse what they're trying to do which is you're so judgmental, rather than recognizing, yeah, God had to bring me to my knees in my, area, my areas of sin also, but in that it becomes there's freedom and repentance and all those different things that are going on there. I'm going to try and stop at the 25 after. For those of you that just came, we're stopping so the kids can come up and practice. Uh, you're welcome to uh, stay, but don't make noise while the kids practice, obviously, and they'll try not to make noise while we do church. So <laughs> it'll, it'll, all, it'll all kind of work itself out. So anyway, uh, if any of this bothers you, please come talk to me because, uh, like I said, I like it because it challenges us. Uh, you don't want to preach an a inaccurate gospel, and you can't just walk around saying this is all that God is. He just loves and loves and loves. And the answer is yes, and he also tells you the truth, which is what godly Christian love is. Uh, not, I'll tell you a lie, be a good person, you'll be fine, or the 11th commandment, just be nice to people. Uh, you know, as long as you follow the 11th commandment, the first 10 don't matter. So, all right? Well, so, if you follow the first one, you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, in that sense, right. Lord, uh, we pray us grace and blessing over the kids today. We continue to lift up our precious loved ones, Lord, who are dealing with COVID and some of the side effects. We pray for others who are still fighting cancer, still fighting uh, chronic situations and diseases that are in their bodies and part of their family and extended family situations. We, we ask, Lord, for clarity in terms of uh, our decisions and ask that you would guard our families as we head into the Christmas season. Help us to honor you in all we say and do. We pray this all in your name, Jesus. God's people say, amen. 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 Go.